بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين والعاقبة للمتقين وأفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد خاتم النبيين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وبعد All praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our Lord and Creator and peace and blessings be upon his blessed messenger and his companions the companions of the messenger peace and blessings be upon him and all those who follow them with good, with excellency, with ihsan the topic for today's discussion is Islam in a prison of culture. By the way, it's my first time at Bradford University. I've been to Bradford. I mean, everybody comes to Bradford. For the fish and chips, the culture of the British culture. They say fish and chips in Bradford is quite famous. And I've tried it many times. You know, we, we, even when on the motorway, we want to go and have the fish and chips of Bradford. Or we go to Mumtaz. By the way, I don't work for them, so I'm not advertising that. And I don't know if they're halal or not, hopefully, inshallah. I'm just saying. But Bradford, alhamdulillah, I've come many times. And it's a city, good city. I mean, in Leicester, they say Bradford is Islamabad. I don't know. But then, again, you might say Leicester is probably Bombay. Because there's a lot of, a lot of people from India. And, um, so, but alhamdulillah, just like Leicester, Bradford has many different communities, British people, uh, people from the subcontinent, from Bangladesh, from Pakistan, from India, and from all various different backgrounds, ethnicities, cultures. And as Muslims, my address to the Muslims initially, as Muslims, Islam comes first before any culture and any ethnicity or any background. This is the basis of our religion, the religion of Islam. When we look at the Quran and when we look at the Sunnah, when we look at the, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we look at the sayings and the traditions of the Messenger of, of Allah, the Messenger of God, peace and blessings be upon him, we find many texts, we find many, many verses of the Quran and many traditions that talk about the importance of being a Muslim as a Muslim, not being a Muslim as an Indian or a Pakistani or a British or a Western or an Eastern or a Northern or a Southern. Islam is a universal religion. It has teachings for all types of people, for all cultures, for all backgrounds, and for any place on the planet, on the face of the earth. A person who's a Muslim, it's easy. If, if a British person wants to become a Mus Muslim, and he, he's a Muslim and he practices Islam, then by all means he can practice Islam. And therefore, Islam, the teachings of Islam need to be given importance over and above any culture. This is the topic and the title of our, our discussion today. Unfortunately, as the brother was saying, that today we see that many Muslims, and this cross cultures, whether Muslims from the subcontinent, whether they're from the Arab world, whether they're from the Eastern world, or from the Western world, or from wherever, culture plays a part in the practicing of Islam. It's very unfortunate. This is a topic that we can talk about, talk about, discuss, but we see every background, the culture plays a part in some way or, or another, in some shape or form in the practice of Islam. If a Muslim, if a community of, of Muslims, they are from the subcontinent, for example, they are from Pakistan or from India or wherever they're from, then their culture, and, and many of the time people don't even want to know or realize or think or study or learn what Islam is really about. Why, 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 why does a person become a Muslim? Why, why is a person believing in God and the final messenger, peace and blessings be upon him and all the other messengers before him, Jesus and Moses and all of them, peace and blessings be upon all of them. As Muslims, we have to believe in all the prophets. It's not sufficient just to believe in Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. As a Muslim, Allah says in the Quran, لا نفرق بين أحد من الرسول. We, we do not separate between any prophets. It is absolutely compulsory, mandatory, necessary for a Muslim to be considered a Muslim 
that he believes in Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, but as Islam portrays Jesus to be, the Prophet of Allah, the Prophet of God, we have to believe in Jesus, we have to believe in Moses. So, why do we believe? Why, why is a person a Muslim? I mean, if I can ask you a question, somebody, brother here, why are you a Muslim? How do you know it's a true religion? Did you study it? Did you? Yeah? Alhamdulillah, mashallah. Anybody else? Why is the brother in that corner with a nice subway? I don't know where he is. Uh, why, why are you a Muslim? Okay. Grew up in a Muslim family. After that you said you realized and you studied, which is good. But many a time, we find mo most Muslims, they are Muslims because they grew up, they were born in a Muslim family, and that's about it. Nothing more than that. Muslim, why? Because my dad was a Muslim, my mom was a Muslim, my brother, sisters, people around me, Muslim, the mosque, yeah, we go to the mosque, Ramadan time comes, yeah, I've seen my community, my culture, Ramadan, we wake up for suhoor, we do iftar, yeah, fasting, tarawi, yeah. Did we ever study why we perform tarawi? Did we ever look in the wisdoms and the rulings of tarawi, why we fast? Why do we believe in Allah? Oh, we know that marriages take place in this such a way because the community has been doing it. You have to go to the mosque, you have to approach the Imam, and there's something said in Arabic which I don't even know. I don't have a clue what it means. It could mean anything. What, 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 you know, this, this is how marriage is done. And this is the reason why people start practicing their culture and following their cultural teachings rather than Islam. Because they have not really looked into what Islam is. It's just the things happening around you. If you were born in, in an Arab country, for example, where a mar marriage and nikah is done in a specific way, then you'll be following that culture if you don't learn the true teachings of Islam. Like one of the cultural practices is the extravagance in dowry and mahar in the Arab culture. A person cannot get married. I mean, this is generally, of course, there are exceptions, but generally, you have to have so much amount of money before you can even marry. I mean, I know so many friends, Arab friends, who... There was a brother I knew who was Palestinian, he used to be in Syria, I used to see him. He used to be so distressed, he was 37 years of age, he was still not married. I said, why don't you marry? He said, I need to at least gather about $40,000 before I can even think of marrying. I need to have a key to my car, key to the factory, and key to the house, before anybody will even consider giving their daughter to me. Extravagance in dowry. Does Islam say that? Of course not. If you look at the subcontinent, the certain ways of them, they're doing of marriage ceremonies and the way divorce is conducted, it's all based on, based on cultural practices. Have we ever learnt what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord and Creator? What is the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon Him eternally? What are His teachings? How is Islam supposed to be practiced? And this is the reason why when we look in the books of Islamic creed, when we look in the books of Aqeedah, there's a, there's a book, famous book in, in Islamic creed, Imam um, Sheikh Ibrahim al laqani who was a Maliki scholar, he writes in his book, and there's a commentary on that, إِذْ كُلُّ مَنْ قَلَّدَ فِي التَّوْحِيدِ إِيمَانُهُ لَمْ يَخْلُ مِنْ تَرْدِيدِ Every individual who becomes a Muslim by following, a person is Muslim just because his parents are Muslim, father, mother, people around him, إِذْ كُلُّ مَنْ قَلَّدَ فِي التَّوْحِيدِ إِيمَانُهُ لَمْ يَخْلُ مِنْ تَرْدِيدِ His Iman is not free from doubt. If I am a Muslim just because my father is a Muslim, my, believe, my parents, my mother, my father, people around me, they were just believers, and I just do because I saw them doing that, then my Iman is weak. But if it was not like that, it was because I was born in a Muslim family, but then I understood, I realized, I studied, I learned, and then I had this conviction and I understood the rulings of Islam. And then I believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's when Iman becomes strong. Faith becomes strong in God, in, in our Creator, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's very important, first of all, that we learn about Islam. And Islam is all about submission. The meaning of Islam, we have two meanings. Islam means peace. Okay, a lot of people, assalamu alaikum, is from the word uh, peace as well. But also has the meaning of submission in it. Al-Istislamu, wal idanu al-Islamu. All these words, they have the meaning of submission. Submitting to the will of God. Submitting to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Total, full, utter submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the meaning of Islam. Meaning, whatever comes in our way, whatever our culture says, whatever our cultural traditions, cultural practices, cultural customs, whatever they are, if they are in conflict with the teachings of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then we follow the word of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Islam means submission. And, and this, this, this submission, you know in the Qur'an, Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord and Creator, 
he talks about the two prophets, Abraham and Ismail, Ismail and Ibrahim, والسلام, peace and blessings be upon both of them. He talks about them, the famous incident story, you know the incident about uh, the slaughtering, when, when Ibrahim والسلام, was, peace and blessings be upon him, was ordered and commanded by Allah to slaughter his own son. It's a long story, I don't want to mention the story. But when this whole, after the narrating and reporting this whole episode in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he says, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَ وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِيلِ When they both became Muslims, that's the literal translation, or you, one translation. When they both, Ibrahim and Ismail, became Muslims. <laughs> what does he mean? They became Muslims? They are already Muslims. They were, they were already the, the worshippers of God at that time. They were already, uh, you know, they, they were prophets of Allah. Let alone them not believing in God, and now Allah saying they, when they both believed, they were the prophets of God. So why did Allah say that when they both became believers? Aslama, when they both become believers. After narrating the whole incident, wherein the father Ibrahim, peace and blessings be upon him, was ordered and commanded by Allah, our Lord and Creator, by God, to slaughter his son, without any hesitation, he just accepted. He submitted, submitted to the will of Allah, and likewise the son as well. He did not say, why dad, you know, why, do, do, why, why don't you go and slaughter a sheep? Why do you have to slaughter me for? No question, no ifs, no buts, nothing. Allah loved this approach and this um, behavior of the two prophets. And he said, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَ When they both became believers, meaning when they both submitted, aslama. The word, same word, Islam, when they both submitted to the will and the command of Allah. So we as Muslims, Muslims have to submit to the will of God. That's the first and foremost. We have to submit to the will of God. And Islam is a religion that is not just a religion. Sorry. Islam is a religion that's not just a religion. Rather, we should not even be saying Islam is a religion. And it's famous, we all know, Islam is a way of life. Islam is not just a collection of rituals like some other religions may be. It's not just a collection of rituals or forms or modes or uh, practices or forms of worship. It's more than that. Islam is a complete way of life. We don't have the separation of church and state in Islam. Islam is a complete way of life. From the time a person wakes up in the morning till the time he goes to sleep, there are teachings in, in the Holy Script, the book, the Quran, and in the sayings and traditions and the teachings of the Messenger of God, peace and blessings be upon him. It's a complete way of life. It's, it teaches you from the moment you wake up, from, from rules of purity to how to clean yourself, how to go to the washroom and bathroom as well for our non-Muslim friends and non-Muslim brothers and sisters. There are, there are teachings in Islam that also tell an individual, a Muslim, how to clean himself when he goes to the washroom. And if somebody has this question, you know, somebody who's not a Muslim, like, likewise a, a person who was not a Muslim in the time of the Messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, he came and asked one of the companions. And he said, لَقَدْ عَلَّمَكُمْ نَبِيُّكُمْ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى الْخِرَاءِ He came to a companion called Salman al-Farsi, who was the Persian, Salman the Persian, from Faris. He said, your prophet, he teaches you everything. كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى الْخِرَاءَ The word khira'a in Arabic means until he teaches you things as basic as how to clean yourself when you go to the washroom and to the toilet. He said, Ajal. He said, why not? We're proud. This is not something to feel uh, degraded about. We're proud about this fact that our Prophet is so unique that he teaches us everything from the time we wake up to the time we go to sleep. A Muslim is a Muslim whether he's in the washroom, whether he's in the bathroom, whether he's walking on the street, whether he's driving a car. Even when you're driving a car, you're a Muslim. Unfortunately, we forget. Driving a car, we don't have to obey the law of the land. I mean, I've seen some rough drivers here in Bradford. Bradford and Manchester, two places where you have a lot of, sorry, you know. But we have to, there are rules of driving a car. You have to obey the law of the land. This is the teaching of Islam. You have to obey the law of the land. And you have to, you don't drive like some kind of maniac. You know, like when I heard from one scholar, he was saying that when you think, if you want to know if something is right or wrong, just put yourself, you know, think and ponder for a moment. When you're driving a car, ponder. If, for example, the Messenger وسلم, was on your place, behind the steering wheel, driving his car, how would he drive? Think, 
Would you drive like a maniac? Would you go through a no entry and one way, you know, the other way around? Or would you start hooting and, you know, just shouting abuse and things like that? Definitely not. If you was to drive, there were no cars in that time, by the way. And it's not a bid I to drive one now as well, by the way. <laughs> but if the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he was to drive a car right now, how would he drive? Put, think for two minutes. How calm would he be? How collective would he be? How humble would he be? Would he always try to just overtake people and not give anybody any way? Or would he, you know, prefer and give preference to other people? That's Islam. Where it's Muslims even was driving a car. Whether we're at the factory, at the shop, walking on the road, at the campus, at the university, at home, with parents, with children, with spouses, wherever we are, we have to be Muslim. It's not just about dressing like a Muslim, it's acting like a Muslim as well. You know, sometimes some people think, I've just dressed like a Muslim, mashallah, I have the lahiyah, the beard, I have, a, you know, I can say this, I've got a lahiyah, so, you know, I'm not, you know, degrading people who have lahiyah. Lahiyah is, mashallah, the sunnah of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, we'll talk about a bit about the dress further along, but... You know, some people think it's enough. I've got the thawb and I have the lihya, the beard, and I have the hat and I have the amala sometimes. And that's it. People think I'm a Muslim, the sister. I've got the niqab and hijab and that's it, sufficient. You know, I'm covering myself. Then whatever way I act and behave, it doesn't matter. That's totally wrong. That's completely Islamic. Husnu surah and husnu sirah. You have to have good character. It's more important. So Islam is a complete way of life. And it has teachings in every area, every, you know, from, from, as I said, from the moment we wake up till the moment we go to sleep. From the moment a person is born till the time he passes away. Even after death there are rules, inheritance laws. Even after we leave this world, the wealth and the estate we leave behind, there's rules attached to that as well. Every moment, everything we do, when we walk, we need to think, am I doing this in accordance with the teachings of Allah? God and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or not. Islam is a complete way of life. It's not just a few things here and there. And unfortunately we as Muslims, we have restricted Islam, many of us. Some of us restrict Islam, as I said, to the external you know, appearance. That's it. That you dress like a Muslim sufficient. Something is just about behaving you know, good in a nice way and good character and that's it, nothing else. Some of us just restrict it, uh, to um, Islam to certain forms and modes of worship. That's not sufficient as well. We have to be a complete Muslim. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu dhkhulu fi silmi kafa. Oh, you who believe, enter into Islam. You're a mu'min, you're a believer, but now submit. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu udhkhulu fi silmi kafa. Enter into Islam completely, totally, wholeheartedly. Don't, أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضِ Do you just pick and choose? Do you take parts of the book of Allah and leave other parts? Do you pick and choose from, yes, let, let, let me look in the Holy Scripture, the Quran, yeah, this suits me, this does not suit me, you know, do you pick and choose from the book of Allah or do you take everything? We have to take everything, we need to be full-time Muslims, not half-time, or part-time, or quarter-time. If you just play a game for 45 minutes, you don't turn up for the second half, what happens? I don't know how Bradford City are doing, but... Well, nobody was Bradford, by the way, I presume. They do? <laughs> Probably everybody supports Liverpool, I won't say Manchester United. But Islam is a complete way of life. You have to be full-time Muslims, full-time Muslims. Every teaching of Islam we need to implement in our lives. Now what I want to do, that was just a small brief you know, kind of introduction. What I want to do is I want to just look at certain areas where it's a lengthy topic. I mean, if we go one by one taking each branch, there are many branches of Islam. We have ibadat, worshipping Allah, then we have a branch. There are actually five branches of Islam. Number one is ibadat, which means worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the rules connected to purity, Wudu, ablution, ghusl, taking a ritual uh, purification, bath, um, all the rules of uh, salah, prayer, this is zakat, giving charity in the path of Allah, hajj and umrah, the pilgrimage, and fasting in the month of Ramadan, prayer, all these rules, just one branch of Islam, which is ibadat, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are five, well the first one is aqidah, your correct belief, but then after that there are four. So if we say four branches of Islam, first is you have correct belief. Number one, worshipping Allah. All the rules. All the rules of prayer, Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, all the rules of Wudu, Ghusr, everything to do with worshipping Allah is just one quarter of Islam. Then we have a second branch of Islam, which is Mu'amalat. 
transactions, business transactions. Islam is also to do with business and trade. How do we do business? Islam doesn't leave us that you can do business how you want. As I said, it's a complete way of life. It's not just about worshipping and that's it. You, you get involved in unlawful transactions, no. Second branch is mu'amalat, business transactions. And number three is mu'ashara. Mu'ashara is social etiquette, how you live with people, how you deal with people, rights of the parents, rights of the children, rights of the spouses, the husband, the wife, brothers, sisters, siblings, people around you, relatives, cousins, and just generally Muslims and non-Muslims. Everybody around you. The humanity and also the rights of animals. Islam has teaches us that there are rights for animals as well. Everybody has rights. How to deal with people around you. This is mu'asha, social etiquette. And then we have the fifth, the fourth category, which is akhlaq and manners, which is good character, good behavior. So these are all various branches of Islam. And in order for a person to be a complete Muslim, he has to he has to believe and he has to practice all the rules associated, associated to all these branches of Islam. So we can go into each category and look at various things, cultural practices, but I've just taken a few examples that I feel may be important in terms of cultural practices and uh, social customs versus Islamic teachings. There's quite a few, but these are certain things that I think are important from my personal experience. I mean, I, I've come across so many people. I, the brother was saying, you know, I, I answer questions at Darul Ifta Institute. I don't know if you've heard of it. I have a website, online q and I have a two-hour phone line where everybody, a lot of people phone. And I have, literally, at the moment, I've got a backlog of about 300 emails that I need to finish answering. It's, 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 there are so many emails. And I have so many people. I was just speaking to somebody from Bradford yesterday, a sister. Again, cultural issues, marriage, marriage issues, divorce issues, a lot of cultural baggage that we bring with us. A lot of cultural baggage. It's so distressing and so saddening at times that Muslims, if, if I start telling you the, the stories that I know, know of or the experiences I have with people, you just need another five hours just to listen to these stories. And some of them are extremely shocking. Extremely shocking. Seriously, some of them, they, they you know, you just, now, I mean, I, I, I've mentioned to some, in a recent lecture somewhere, I said, now nothing shocks me. I've heard the most shocking thing. I won't tell you what that thing is, but, but nothing shocks me. You'll be amazed what some of the Muslim families and communities are up to, and, and what people are doing. And, and it's got nothing whatsoever to do with Islam. It's got nothing whatsoever, like the brother was saying about honor killings. I mean, that's got nothing whatsoever. It's absolutely haram, sinful, unlawful, categorically forbidden. It's got nothing, not even this much connection. It's actually you know, really far away from the teachings of God and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But why, why do people, so, I mean, with the media as well, I mean, I, I have a problem with them as well. When, when something, when, you know, somebody just who sounds like someone Khan did something, then you say, the news will come. A Muslim by the name of something something Khan, you know, killed his daughter and something like that. And you have a John Terry or Michael, you know, who's a Christian by name. These are Muslims just by name. They were born in a Muslim family. And he there was gun crime in Nottingham or in Liverpool. The news reporter would say, oh, a Christian called by the name of John, Paul, or Terry, or, or Mike, or Stephen did, did this. No. Why with Muslims? But that's another case, another story. But with Muslims as, as well, these are just, they are just by name Muslims. As I said, they were just born in Muslim families. We, we are born in Muslim families. We think we're Muslims. It's not easy to be Muslims. You have to work at it. You just don't be Muslim because you were born in a Muslim family. And Allah says this in the Quran. He said that Bala man aslam wajhu. You know, Allah relates at that time in the time of the Messenger of God that the Christians and Jews, some of them, some of the Christians and some of the Jews, used to say that we will enter paradise. It's, it's for us. وَقَالُوا لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُودًا وَنَصَارًا. Some of the Christians and some of the Jews, they never used to do anything. Work for it. They used to just say. Well, we'll enter Jannah. Paradise is for us. Allah said, Qulahatu burhanakum. Bring your proof. What have you done to earn paradise? In kuntum sadiqin. And then he said, Bala man aslama wajahu lillah. It's not just easy to, you know, enter paradise. And this is actually relating about the people at that time, about some of the Christians and Jews in the time of the Messenger of God, and actually teaching Muslims a lesson. Whenever the Quran relates about previous times, it's actually teaching us a lesson that you, O oh Muslims, believers, don't make the same mistake. Don't think, okay, yeah, we're Muslims, that's it. Paradise is for us, booked. Hotel we've already reserved. Just make sure that it doesn't happen that you go there and say, sorry, you don't have a reservation. This is what Allah is trying to tell us. 
that it's not about just, you know, being a Muslim and that's it. We, as Muslims, sometimes we think like that. We think just that's it. Paradise is for us. All these people, kuffar, in the hell. And we're just in Jannah. We, we belong to God and God belongs to us. And that's it. We're the chosen people and we're just... Sometimes some Muslims think like that. And they don't do nothing about Islam. Nothing. Not even 1% of practicing of Islam. Maybe in Ramadan, they might just go to the masjid here and then come back. And then for the whole year, they never see a mosque in their lives. There are, there, are mo- there are many Muslims like that, and I'm being frank here. A good percentage, a large portion of Muslims, they are in fact, in reality, they are just Muslims by name. And according to some scholars, you can't even call them Muslims. Seriously, some scholars are of the opinion that those who do not, I mean, those who don't pray, according to some scholars, they leave the fold of Islam. There's a difference of opinion, but one, من ترك الصلاة متعمدا فقد كفر Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal radiallahu anhu, his opinion was one salah, one fajr, you haven't prayed. You've left the path of Islam. Your marriage is broken, invalidated. You have to renew your marriage. And that's not just Imam Ahmed. There are many scholars of that opinion. Okay, it's not accepted by everybody. Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu the, uh, and Imam Shafi'i and Imam Malik do not subscribe to this view. It's a difference of opinion between the scholars. But nevertheless, it shows how grave it is to just even leave one prayer. And then we think, just because my name is Muhammad or Abdullah or Isa or Yusuf or Musa, I'm just a Muslim. What have we done to earn paradise? We have to take our time. In this world, we have time for everything, brothers and sisters. We have time to study, which is important. We have time to get, get our degrees. Important, without a doubt. We need to. We need to be out there. We have time to do business. We have time to make money. Important. كسب الحلال فريضة بعد الفريضة. We have time for everything. But a Muslim man, he spends 70 years of his life. He doesn't have time. That in his 70 years of his life, he has not read the Quran from beginning to end with translation and understanding. Do you know how many Muslims? You go into the masjids. Most Muslims have never understood the Quran. I'm not saying it's absolutely mandatory, but it's something that's highly encouraged. I was once coming from, um, from London, I think, one of the universities, and this Christian man, he sat next to me in the train, just discussing issues. I talked about abortion, and he was talking, we were talking about abortion in Christianity and in Islam and everything. And um, then he said to me, you know what, I want to ask you one question. It just doesn't make sense to me. I said, what's that? He said, what I don't understand is that so many Muslims, they don't have a clue what their holy scripture is saying. I said, you're right. Because you, so many, how many percent? I said, maybe 80, 90 percent. They don't have a clue. We as Christians, if we are practicing, if we say, somebody says, I am a Christian, then I would read the Bible at least once to see at least, you know, what am I believing in? The first book I would read would be the Bible. We recite Quran sometimes, and even that recitation with Tajweed. Let's listen to the recitation of the Tajweed. We don't even have to time to learn the correct way of pronouncing the words of the Quran and words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But seriously, it's a big problem. I mean, we go to a lot of these Asian masajid and you hear people, you know. I mean, I'm not trying to sort of put them down or anything like that. It's just a concern. We need to do something about this. There are Muslims there, you listen to them, re- listen, 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 listen to them re- reciting the Quran. Sometimes they are making grave errors that actually translate as words of kufr and disbelief. Seriously. And then, you know, if that's not going to happen, then what's, when, when are they going to start actually understanding the Quran? At least the verses of the Quran that we read and recite in our prayer. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. What does it mean? الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين What does he mean? قل هو الله أحد قل عوض برب الفلق These are short chapters in the Quran Last few chapters At least the meaning of those You are speaking with God There's conversation taking place Between the worshipper and, Lord and his Lord This is conversation This is kalam This is conversation interaction Between God and his servant and it's like, and this is the reason why when we're praying, we're thinking Allahu Akbar, and I'm thinking about, you know, my business, and I'm thinking every single thought on the face of the earth, planet comes to my mind, except that I'm in front of my God. Why? Because we don't understand the meaning. We can't concentrate because we don't understand the meaning. If we knew, قُلْ Allahu Akbar, I'm reciting, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say Allah is one. We knew the meaning. Allahu Samad, He's independent, He's not in need of anybody. If we knew these meanings, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Then we would concentrate. If we know, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, 
You can say Sayyidina, by the way, before salutations, even in prayer, according to many scholars, some might say no, but Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. What, what, what does it mean? When we say at tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat wa salamu alayka, what does it mean? So this, this is very important, that we should not just be Muslims, just because we were raised in a Muslim family and that's about it. These cultural practices that we have. Now for example, marriage. Let me look at a few examples in marriage. Marriage, brothers and sisters, and I, I don't want to go into the topic of marriage. I've recently been given so many talks on marriage and I'm actually so bored with the topic of marriage. Topic of talking about marriage, okay. You know, once I said I'm bored about, uh, with marriage, somebody said, you're bored with marriage? I said, no, no, the topic. Is I've, <laughs> I've spoken so much on marriage, and I've still, again, I've got a talk coming up in a couple of weeks' time on marriage. But certain issues in marriage, marriage, first of all, in Islam, marriage is ibadah, worship. It's worship, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's worshipping your Lord and Creator. It's actually a form of worship. It's not a r regular, mundane, worldly activity. It's a sunnah. It's a, a practice of the Messenger of God, peace and blessings be upon him. It's an act of worship. The Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him, he married. He actually practically married himself. Islam does not have this understanding of, you know, um, quenching your sexual desires. Islam understands and realizes that human being has these desires and they need to be fulfilled, but, but in a right way, in a correct way, in a lawful manner, with a proper marriage, not in an unlawful manner. Okay, so it's an act of act of worship. It's an act of ibadah, and that's why. I, I've mentioned this many times, that when people get married, they need to understand this, realize this. Now why are you getting married for? What's the intention? Correct your intention, it should be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am only getting married because, well, the main reason I am marrying is to please my Lord and my Creator. And so that it will help me in this life, it will help me. I will be a help for my spouse to get close to, to her God, or his God. This is why people marry, to bring one another close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the whole idea. It's not a routine, mundane, worldly act. Now, this is the understanding of Islam. And Islam has made marriage very easy, very simple. Extremely simple marriage. Marriage has been made extremely simply simple, but unfortunately, the more simple marriage is, the more difficult we as Muslims have made marriage. Marriage is an ibadah. Again, you know when, when, the, when the person goes to the mosque or whatever the marriage ceremony is taking place, the imam recites the khutbah, the sermon. He's, he recites verses of the Qur'an. Again, we won't have a clue what the guy is talking about. You know, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu taqullaha wa qoolu qawlan sadeeda Ya ayyuhal nasu taqul haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon Ya ayyuhal nasu taqul rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsi wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathira We don't have a clue. We were just, you know, in the mosque, yeah, we're just worried about when do we go home and get to our hotel. That's the worry on our head. And that's just, just thinking about one thing, bedroom. By the way, marriage is more than just a bedroom. But this marriage is an ibadah. Well, why are these verses recited? You know these verses, if you look, look at the meanings of these verses. These three verses of marriage which are recited from the Qur'an at the time of the marriage ceremony, they have nothing whatsoever to do with marriage itself. There are many verses in the Qur'an and many sayings of the Messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, that deal with marriage, but not one verse is read and recited. It was a sunnah, the way of the Messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he used to recite these verses. Why would he recite these verses? Because it's to do with taqwa, the fear of Allah, about worshipping Allah, about getting close to Allah. So marriage is an act of ibad and worship. And the more Islam has made it extremely simple, since it is an ibadah, since marriage is an act of worship, since marriage is a form of worshipping Allah, Allah has made extremely marriage extremely simple, extremely easy. But the problem, as I said, our cultural practices, the more marriage is easy in Islam, the more difficult we have made. It's, you know, marriage is so simple. You know how simple it is? You don't even need, I mean sunnah of course, but I'm telling, I'm telling you, I'm talking to you about the basic, basic, absolute integral requirements. You need two witnesses, you need the man, you need the woman, and that's it. Nothing else. You have two witnesses, one says, for example, the woman says, I give you myself to you in marriage. The man says, does I wish to, qabiltuki, I've accepted you. 
Two witnesses, witness guys. Done. Nobody's getting married here, by the way. If you want, to come down. We've got so many people here as witnesses. Any volunteers? But marriage is extremely, extremely simple. It's the most simple thing. But we, because of our cultural customs, we have made it so difficult, self-imposed conditions. Like, for example, I was talking about dowry, maha. The man, I'm not saying the man needs no income. He needs to have a stable background income, that's fine. But waiting until a man, you know, provides this and provides that and provides this and until he has this much amount of money and this much dowry and this custom and that custom, these are all nothing but customs, cultural practices. And it's serious because, you know, because of this problem of cultural practices, we see, we see the result. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in one hadith that إِذَا خَطَبَ إِلَيْكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ خُلُقَهُ وَدِينَهُ فَزَوِّجُوهُ When you receive a proposal from somebody whose manners and character and behavior and conduct you, you are happy with, then just get your daughter married off to that person. If you don't, if you delay marriages, if you wait until my great-great-granddad comes from Pakistan and India, and this person comes from there, and that person comes from here, and this cousin-sister comes from there, and this man comes from here, and you wait for every practice and cultural custom to be fulfilled, then what will happen? You know what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him, says? If you do not do that, if you don't get young people married off quickly, there will be widespread destruction and fitna and tribulation on the land. And that's what's happening today. When the doors of halal are closed, and I, I address this to the parents, we don't have parents probably here, but I recently, you know, I was in Canada in December, uh, one of the conferences there, RIS, and I, my whole topic was on this. The address was to the parents. And after that, subhanAllah, so many young people came to me. I was saying, I was so happy today. I was so happy my, my, my parents were sitting there and heard you talking. <laughs> and one, one, one brother came to me. He's, mashallah, he's, a, he's the reverse brother. He's a Canadian brother. He came to me and said, you know, I'm so upset. My parents missed your lecture. They came just after your lecture. He repeated again for them. <laughs> I said, inshallah, I'll have a talk with them if you want. But for young people, I'm telling you, parents really need to realize Seriously, parents, Muslim parents need to realize they are not still living in Bombay or Delhi or India or Pakistan or Islamabad or Karachi. They are living here. Don't make it difficult for your children. I mean, it's difficult out there. You know, the, 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 it's difficult. I mean, a man, a grown-up man or a woman, a young person, temptations are there. It's difficult. I mean, I have so many people who say that we're married and it's difficult. So what about the people who are not married? <laughs> it's difficult out there for, for young people. So make it easy. Marriage is so simple. They want to marry somebody, make it simple. Just don't wait. You have to be from the same culture, same background, same ethnicity. There is no validity for this in Islam. Islam says kafa, suitability. Okay, compatibility. You may have compatibility with somebody from a complete total background. Different background, different ethnicity, different culture. The brother may be uh, from, uh, you know, from China and the sister may be from you know, South Africa, for example. You might, you might have somebody who's your close relative, your first cousin, okay, but no compatibility. You're studying medicine, she's studying law. Okay, you might have a first cousin, nothing in common, no chemistry, nothing in common. And you might have somebody, you're from Punjab and she's from like, from Bangladesh for example. And you have everything in common. That's what Islam asks. Gafa a suitability. There's nothing wrong whatsoever in a man marrying who's from a different background to a woman. I don't know where this has come from. Parents don't understand. And the worst is when they find it difficult for their daughters to get married to revert brothers. SubhanAllah. This is the worst. Person is a Muslim. He's a Muslim. Just because he's white. You know, they don't want to give their daughters. Where does that come from? You know, all the companions, they were all reverts. Do you know every single companion was a revert? They were, not, they were not believing in the Messenger of God. They all accepted and embraced Islam. Every single... And the worst is when somebody actually still, you know, says that, uh, you know, this the Gora or whatever they say. <laughs> That's the worst. They still consider that person to be a non-Muslim. He's a better Muslim than you. Do you know what? There are so many people who embrace Islam that are far better Muslims than me and you put together. 
I know people like that. They are far better Muslims than us. People who come into the fold of Islam, they embrace Islam. They are not just born typically like us in a Muslim family and they just see culture around them and they start practicing Islam. They learn, they read the book. Before they become Muslim, they actually read the book from beginning to end. We're 80, but we still haven't read the Quran. They read the book. They think about God, they think about the Islam, they look at the message of Islam. Then when they wholeheartedly, you know, their heart sets on Islam, that's when they embrace Islam. And they're very extremely practicing Muslims. This is generally the case, unless if somebody just became Muslim because they just wanted to marry. That's, that's sometimes a problem, just, you know, just in a relationship, oh, you have to embrace, and, you know, Islam, and my parents won't accept you just because, you know, not a Muslim, you have to be a Muslim. I don't know if that marriage is ever going to last, but it may do, may not. But Somebody who wholeheartedly, truly embraces Islam, that person, I'm telling you, m most of the times is a far better Muslim than those people who are born in Muslim families. These ethnicities, background, and then this is all based on pride, vainglory. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a hadith, إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَذْهَبَ عَنْكُمْ عُبِّيَّةَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ Verily, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has removed this عُبِّيَّة. عُبِّيَّة means, you know, this boasting. Uh, boasting with your ancestors, with your parents, that I am uh, from Mirpur, and I am from here, and I am from there. And this is completely, كُلُّكُمْ مِنْ آدَمْ وَآدَمْ خُلِقَ مِنْ تُرَابِ All of you are from Adam. All of you are from Adam, peace and blessing be upon him. And Adam was created from dust. We are all created from the earth. Every single one of us, created from the earth. There's no fadila, there is no preference. لا فضل لعربين على عجمي إنك لست بخير من أحمر ولا أسود. Being black or white does not make you any good. There's, there's no virtue in being white, black, green, purple, blue, whatever. إلا أن تفضله بتقوى. It's the taqwa. You know, Sayyidina Bilal رضي الله عنه. Who is Abyssinian? From Africa. He was so close to the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم. And the Messenger of God, you know, when he realized that there was some kind of Something, you know, kind of uh, between, if it, if it may lead to some kind of friction between two different groups, communities, he was there first to stop that. He was extremely against this idea of different tribes arguing or debating or quarreling or fighting amongst each other. He actually gathered two tribes. They were fighting for years and years pre-Islamic Arabia. Khazraj and Aus, I think. خزرج الأوس أن الله توصى بهذا النقران وكنتم على شفا حفرة من النار فأنقذكم منها. When he talks about unity, يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقول الله حق تقاتي ولا تموتون إلا وأنتم واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا واذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ كنتم عداء فألف بين قلوبكم. He brought the hearts together. This is such a big problem in our, you know, this marriage issues about cultural customs about, you know. being uh, from the same caste. And that leads us to this forced marriage issue. I don't know who in ever said that Islam advocates forced marriages. I don't know where that's come from. Pick up any book, any book of hadith. Pick up Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. Pick up Sahih Muslim. These are collections of hadith. Sahih al-Bukhari is the main collection of prophetic sayings and traditions. Asahu al-kitabi ba'da kitab illa. The most authentic book after the book of Allah, even verses of the Quran. But I'm talking about explicit, you know, statements of the Messenger, peace and blessings be upon him. Pick up any book, you'll find hadiths clear. You find the word la ijbar, la ijbar. There is no force, there is no force. A man or a woman, a son or a daughter can never Islamically be forced to marry who they want, don't want to marry. Never. It's absolutely sinful. If parents force their children to marry, they will actually be guilty of, of a major crime in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is basic. This is not rocket science. It's basic teachings of Islam. Basic. Sometimes people think, really? Is that what Islam says? I don't know why, why people are so astonished. This is a basic ruling of Islam. I mean, there's clear hadiths. For example, uh, there's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Al-Bikru al tusta'maru fi nafsiha. In abad, fala jawaza alayha. A non-married woman, she will be asked, you have to seek her consent before she is married off. If she refuses, there is no way over her. There is no permissibility of marrying her off without her. I mean, there are so many distressing stories like that. I've talked to so many sisters taken to Pakistan, 
passports being confiscated. I'm sorry, I don't have anything against Pakistan. You know, subhanAllah. I actually studied in Pakistan. I lived in Karachi for two, three years. And I love Pakistan. I wouldn't go there right now, by the way. <laughs> but it was just a nice place. Actually, I really enjoyed my time in Karachi. And I also went to the Punjab area, which is not bad. And I went to all sorts of places, you know, for a bit of touring. Um, but I loved it. It was one of the places I really liked, enjoyed my time. Um, you know, used to go to the restaurants and then go and have some nice barn, barn you know, the, uh, the sweet barn with all the different types of things. And that's, you know, when I started eating barn and I might just go and have some barn here in Bradford. But I really enjoyed Pakistan. Pakistan, mashallah, you know, Pakistani people are good people. It's not that I have anything. And my original, my back, I mean, I was born here, but uh, uh, background is from India. But I, I very rarely, I mean, the mo I don't have this, you know, thing about it. Indian or Pakistani or anything like that. Rather, the, the people who are very close to me, my close friends, most of them are all Pakistanis. Most of them. The, the people who work with me on the website, deal with the website, the people, most of them are all Pakistanis. So, mashallah, you know, they're, they're very good people. But it's just very unfortunate. The reason why a lot of things come out from Pakistani communities is because there are a lot of Muslims. Whenever you have more people in the community, you have good and you have a lot of cases of bad. But there's so many people I've spoken to. There was one sister, she was about 18, taken away, passports confiscated, she was taken to Lahore, beaten up. She can't even say a word. She's so scared to say even one word. Beaten up by her brothers. I mean, brothers born and bred here, don't they have, have a brain? Don't they have an intellect given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Parents, okay, they're probably culturally oriented. The brothers are born and bred here, degrees. Studied at university still. You know, force, forcing marriage and saying that if you say no, if you go against a mother's wishes, then that's it. You have a blue and a black eye. It's a big problem. Forced marriages have no place in Islam, no place for Sarah. But by the way, I will just mention this to you. There's a difference for our especially non-Muslim friends. There's a difference between... <coughs> There's a difference between forced marriages and arranged marriages. There's a massive difference. Okay? Don't confuse the two, dear non-Muslim friends. Do not confuse the two. There's a big difference. Arranging means just to arrange, helping, assisting. If you want to get married, you come to me and say, okay, look, let me help you. If you want to get married? No? <laughs> if you do, then you can come to me, I'll help you. Arranging, you have to arrange. You know, you can't just like your brother can't just walk up their sister, let's sit down and get married. <laughs> it has to be arranged. Okay? So it's planning beforehand. Parents helping, assisting, you talk to parents, you talk to relatives, they know somebody, there might be a sister out there, there might be a brother there, mashallah, you know, you might have some compatibility, things in common. You have to arrange. I mean arranging is it's part it's a w effective way of finding a suitable person for marriage. It's not an Islamic injunction in of itself, and neither is it prohibited. It's just something, if somebody wants to go through that path, it's fine. You, you find, a, you know, you ask around and you find somebody, somebody uh, um, suggests that, yes, you know, normally in every community you have those aunties. They know, they know everybody. Those aunties, mashallah, they all day, you know, they have a very good job. But they actually get rewarded. It's a great reward. Helping somebody get married is a great reward. You know, we think they're just sitting, got nothing better to do. But they actually do have a lot of reward. They're helping people find spouses and fulfill their sunnah. Okay? So, this is arranging. Arranging is no problem. As long as the ultimate final choice is lies and rests with the person married. Ultimate final choice lies with the person who's marrying. That's the most important thing. Parents can say, look, and I, I, when, I, when I say to the young, younger people, I say, look, consider what your parents have to say. Don't just say, okay, no, I don't want to hear, just say, I don't want to hear who, who you're suggesting, forget it. Don't want to hear anything. No, no, no. If you do that, then that's the wrong way as well. You have to respect your parents. Consider, talk to them. Yeah, okay, there's somebody you think might be suitable for me. Fine, let me see. And if you think that they're not suitable for you, then just in a respectful way. Respect is very important with parents. The most important right parents have is respect in Islam. We have two things. We have respect and we have obedience. Respect is an absolute right, which means that there are no ifs and buts. Any situation, respect is necessary. Whether parents force you to, you to do something wrong, sinful, haram, respect is there. But obedience is depends. 
Sometimes you have to obey, sometimes you don't have to obey. If they, for example, tell you not to pray, you must disobey them. It depends. There's a whole fiqh, you know, detailed explanation of when and when you have to obey or disobey, etc. So, with respect to say, you won't be sinful. Say, look, this person is not right for me. And remember, your criterion in, in marriage, if you do have talk on marriage, criteria should be Islam, of course, based on that. But this is, this is the teaching of Islam. Res- consider, and then if you do not agree, the final, ultimate choice has to be with the two people who are marrying, because they are marrying. Another big problem in our culture is like when two people marry, it's not just two people marrying, it's like the whole, you know, khandan from here, and the whole family, extended family from two people, and two families are marrying. The granddads and the grandmas and everybody from... I'm not saying people should not be involved. They should be involved. How? Be happy for them. But leave them to it. Don't interfere. Interference is one of the greatest of problems because of which marriages break down. Don't interfere. Let them carry on with their life. I mean, again, marriage, I mean, the time is short. There are many customs and cultural practices. Like, for example, you know, um, one of, I just made some notes, some of the things that, um, I talked about extravagance in Mahra and Dowry. Uh, you know, the Dowry, as I mentioned, so I'll, I'll move away from there. That, that's a cultural, that's an Arabian cultural practice. Extravagance in, in dowry. Um, Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu anhu used to say, Ala la tughalu nasa. Make sure do not be extravagant in the amounts of mahar and dowry you pay at the time of marriage. فَإِنَّهَا لَوْ كَانَتْ مَكْرُمَةً فِي الدُّنْيَا وَتَقْوَنْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ لَكَانَ أَوْلَاكُمْ بِهَا النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ Had paying extortionate amounts as dowry being something regarded as an honorable thing and a virtuous thing, most rightful person would have been your messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would have given his wife extortion amounts as dowry, but he never did. So, dowry as well, this is a cultural custom, extortionate amounts of dowry. And you know what? Now, it's even worse. The woman has to give the dowry. Subhanallah. Seriously, there are some cultures. The woman's family, the woman's father has to give a car. You know, like one brother said to me, I'm going to get married to this, you know, this sister because his, her dad's told me he's going to give me a nice mini kuka. <laughs> I said, for you or for her? There's no such a thing in Islam. These are all cultural things. In Islam, the only thing is a minimum, a minimum amount. Mahar al-Fatima, the sunnah amount, which is around, I don't know how much it is right now, um, approximately something like about 300 pounds. Approximately, it depends on the silver grams. That's it, nothing else. Man gets married, woman, fix 300 pounds as dowry, you're done and dusted with, relax and enjoy life. That's it, what are all these cultural customs coming from? They have no place whatsoever in Islam. You know, the bride has to give this, and, and the parents have to, from this side have to give this, and they have to give that. And these all prolong and delay marriages, and because of which doors of haram and unlawful sins open up. The more difficult we make marriage, the more marriage, the more difficult we make, the more doors for unlawful activities open up. The more doors for unlawful illicit relationships open up. And then after marriage, there are many rules of Islam after marriage. You know, after marriage, there's a hadith in Sunnah Al-Tirmidhi. But the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was talking about the wife, he said that, oh men, teach, treat your women in a nice way. And then he said that, فَإِنَّمَا هُنَّ عَوَانٌ عِنْدَكُمْ لَيْسَ تَمْلِكُونَ شَيْئًا غَيْرَ ذَلِكُ these, wi- these women of yours, your wife, she has left her father, mother, brother, sister, everybody behind. She's left everybody behind. And she's come to live with you. عَوَانٌ عِنْدَكُمْ She's restricted herself to you. And hence you do not owe any other thing above the fact that she's li- living with you, she's moved in with you. That's it. She's living with you, she's tied, uh, you know, the bond of marriage, and she's given that commitment, that's it. Over and above that, you don't have no right. This is hadith. Where does all these rules come that, I mean, look, you know, don't take these things out of context, but these are cultural things, okay? There's no way in Islam that a daughter-in-law has to serve the parents-in-law. No way. She is not even sinful. She has a right to live separately if she wants to. This is the basic right of Islam. Sukna. Sukna is one of the rights the man has to provide shelter. I've actually written articles on this. It's on the website as well. On the website as well, if you see Sunni Path website. She has a separate sukna. If she wants a shelter, an area, if you want, you have to, If a man needs to look after his own parents, 
then do it yourself. Don't force your wife to do it. You, if you want, you live next door, go every day, look after your parents, do everything you must do, because looking after parents is one of the greatest central obligations of Islam. You have to look after your parents. You can't just, like, like when I mentioned this once, somebody said, oh, might as well just send the parents to the nursing home now. I said, no, 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 that's, that's not what I meant. It doesn't mean you send them away to the nursing home or anything like that. You look after your parents, but don't force your wife, because she doesn't have to do it Islamically. Yes, if she does so, she will be greatly rewarded, she will get a lot of reward, thawab, ajr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know what the wisdom behind this is? Look, let me explain this to you. You know what the wisdom is, and I've mentioned this before as well. The wisdom is that, look, if we learn, if the parents-in-law, the father-in-law, the mother-in-law, the daughter, you know, uh, they understand, they realize that, look, the daughter-in-law, she doesn't have to really do anything for us. Okay? She doesn't have to do anything for us. If she does, She's doing a favor on us. They have this understanding in the mind, in the brain. They realize that. Now what will happen? Daughter-in-law comes, and if she does some household work, if she looks after the parents-in-law, if she does good to the mother-in-law and the father-in-law, she takes care of the household affairs, the mother-in-law will think, wow, she's, she doesn't really have to do this. But look, look how much she's doing. So she'll always thank her. She'll show her appreciation. She'll show her gratitude. She'll always be grateful. She will not think it's a God-given right. She will not expect it. She will not demand it. She will appreciate it. And if she appreciates it, what will she do? What will she do? What will she say to her? She'll thank her. And you know, with women, if you thank her more, the more they do it. <laughs> the more you appreciate something, the more women do it. So in this case, she'll actually be doing more. The mother-in-law will say, no, no, Jazakallah, 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 you know, it's really good. You know, you don't have to do it, no, no. And she'll want to do more. And she'll actually do more out of her own will. Whilst in the latter case, when it's demanded, expected, when the salt is a bit more, a bit less, she gets scolded. Okay? In that case, what happens? She gets frustrated as well. Why, why is she shouting at me for? I don't want to do it. And even if she does something, it will be out of force. It will be out of force, out of frustration. Something done out of your own will, with, full, uh, with, with a full heart, wholeheartedly. It's much better than just doing something, just being forced and frustration and just, we don't really want to do it. And then that leads to breakdown of marriages. Do you know how many marriages are broke down because of the interference of the in-laws? So many marriages. And people think it's Islam. I actually gave a talk once on rights in Leicester. You know, Leicester's not too good, you know, as well. I mean, so many cultural practices in a masjid. That's the last time I gave a talk in a masjid in Leicester. It was just, it was, it was actually women, it was only women, me and the, there was another person, this was like three, four years ago. I talked about rights of husband, rights of wife. And I said all this about the rights of women, I went through rights of wife. I talked about the husband as well, many rights of the husband, one, two, three, four, five, this topic on its own. I talked about the rights of the wife, that's, you know, good treatment and then separate shelter. She, you have to, the husband has to, and there was like chaos in this time. All these old ladies, they really went against me. The young ones were happy. <laughs> But the old ones, subhanAllah, like some people are phoning my mom and this and that, and the old ones So what, where's this guy? And some of them said that we've been living 25 years in Leicester and all these old, old imams are there. Nobody's ever said this. Where's this guy kid come on the block and telling us, you know, what Islam is? Seriously, some people said that. And what, what's the, what, what is he teaching us Islam? All these people, my father's an imam, he's been old there, he's been about 30 years. So they said, his father has never said this, and where, where has this person come out from? So then I had a shout in my dad. I said, come on, you say that as well. So my dad actually did say this in Urdu. <laughs> so after that, people calmed down. He said, look, these are the true teachings of Islam. These are the true teachings of Islam. We just, we, we, you know, it's all cultural things. So even after marriage, I mean there are so many, so many examples, forced marriages as I said, unlawful, serving in-laws as I mentioned, separate ac accommodation, uh, physical abuse, domestic violence has nothing whatsoever to do with Islam, nothing. People try to substantiate or prove, you know, their action by quoting hadith or the Qur'an, wadribuhunna, and then bang, 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 and you know, uh, ambulance coming and this and that. And, no, this is not what Islam says. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, يَعْمِدُ أَحَدُكُمْ إِمْرَأَتَهُ جَلْدَ الْعَبْدِ فَلَأَلَّهُ يُضَاجِعُهَا مِنْ آخِرِ يَوْمِهِ One of you beats and strikes your spouse, your wife, as, like, as though she was like some kind of a slave. And then, in the middle, and then at the end of the day, when it's time to sleep, then what happens, you know, you're all cozy and all you're sorry and you know, you mean it and all that. Meaning, Meaning, how can this individual even think? During the day, he's beating her up, 
And then at night he thinks, yeah, she's going to be all pali pali with him. How, how can she, he even expect her to um, respond to his advances when he beats her during the day? This is what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying. أُولَٰئِكَ لَيْسَ بِخِيَارِكُمْ Those people who beat up the spouses, they are not good people. In the words of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If our Messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, if he's saying that we are, this person who beats up his spouse, who beats up the wife, is not a good person, then without a doubt, there is no shak, there is no doubt that this person is not a good person. We are not saying he's not a good person. The Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, he is saying he's not a good person. So this as well, I mean, is a topic in itself and has nothing whatsoever to do with, with Islam. And then, I want to just briefly have five minutes. Divorce, there are so many cultural things in divorce. Seriously, divorce is like a big problem. Things like, for example, if a person is divorced, this comes from the Hindu culture, I think. A person, if a woman is divorced, it's difficult for her to marry again. A'udhu Billah, where does that come from? Where does it say Islam? Islam encourages a woman who is divorced, move on, get another husband. No problem whether she's 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. It doesn't matter. Even if you're 80, you need a companion because marriage is not just about bed, as I said, bedroom. You need a companion in life. So, after divorce, or when the husband passes away, leaves this world, that's it. Can't get married. Just when was it? I think two, three days ago I spoke to somebody. Somebody phoned me that, uh, yeah, I was speaking to somebody, their, their, their father is in his uh, 60s. And I just asked, this was, I think, uh, what is it, Thursday, yeah? I think it was on Monday I spoke to somebody on the phone. And the father is really dis depressed, and all these years, the mother actually passed away when, when they were all young, two, three, four, so he's been without a wife for a good 30, 40 years, okay? And he's like really sad and depressed and, and doesn't do anything, nothing active. And, and this um, daughter of his had all these, you know, things in her mind that, you know, why, you know, is, is he in the state? So I asked one question. Uh, did he ever marry after that? I said, no. He said he wanted to, he was thinking of, but there were too many cultural c constraints. Astaghfirullah. It's considered to be a taboo in the society. I said, that's the worst mistake that he did. And you know what, brothers and sisters, if you know that something is right according to Islam, don't ever think about who's going to say what and when. Don't ever think about that. If you think, if you're always going to be concerned about what people are going to say, what the community will say, what the people in my culture will say, what people will say, don't ever bother about that. As long as you know Allah and His Messenger are happy with you. If they are happy with you, don't ever ever think about what people will say because if you you never p please people if you if they're happy today tomorrow they'll find something else and if you do something they'll, be, they'll talk for a while and then after a year it's died down nobody will even remember you nobody will even think about you there'll be another big problem in the community that they'll have to talk about and shut up you, you've moved on so don't don't just worry about who's going to say what that's the last thing that should be on the mind divorce if there's a need for a divorce if there's a need for a divorce, Islam says, Abghadul halali ilallahi talaq. The worst or the most disliked of the permissible, the legitimate, the lawful things. Lawful. Divorce is lawful. The most disliked of the lawful things is divorce. Which means that divorce is not unlawful, sinful, haram, dirty, nasty. It's not. We, in our culture, we have made divorce to be something like what? An evil. It's not an evil. It's sometimes the last resort. It's a, sometimes you have to go through a divorce. Yes, as a last resort. You try. You go through all the avenues and you try saving your marriage. But sometimes there's no solution except for a divorce. Now, don't think what people are going to say. If you're just, you know, um, uh, going through your marriage just for the sake of it, what kind of marriage is this? Divorce is permissible. Therefore, this, you know, and you know why this, why we need to know that divorce is permissible? Because, I'll tell you why, and I will end on this, inshallah. Because this contributes to many other problems. Like, for example, when we have this notion, we have this understanding, we think divorce is evil, it's nasty, it's dirty, it's something that we should, you know, it's, it's, it's an evil thing, it's a haram, sinful thing. And what will happen? When divorce takes place, there has to be somebody guilty. 
There has to be a guilty party. Because it's wrong. Somebody has to be blamed. Who's going to be blamed? The man will say, the wife was at fault. She will say, it was him. You know, nobody looks at their own faults, of course. You know, they're all blaming, both are blaming one another, blaming each other's families. The, you know, like, uh, the, 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 the wife will say, yeah, you know, my husband, like, I've heard this a lot. He was okay, but it's like, it really, was, it was his mother. She's the nasty one, you know, the wicked one. <laughs> she spoiled everything, and, you know, it wasn't really him. But all pointing fingers at the husband's family. The husband's family points fingers at the wife's family. Because, you know, it's like two families have married as well in the beginning, so that's another start, you know, that took place. But now, divorce as well. So now when two families marry, two families have to divorce. And two families are fighting with one another. And they become lifelong enemies. Lifelong enemies. Seriously, those two families have gone through divorce, with the exception, in Rahima Rabbuk, except the one whom Allah has mercy on. But generally, two lifelong enemies, these families. Why? Because the reason was that they... They thought divorce is sinful, it's dirty, hence somebody has to be blamed. Now nobody wants themselves to be blamed, so they will blame the other party. But if they understood, if they learned, they, they realized that according to Islam, divorce is not sinful, it is not haram, it's not, it's sometimes, even you can have the two greatest of people, you know, you can have the Imam al-Junaid of the time, and the Rabi'a al-Basriya of the time, and they can also have divorce. You, the messenger. Ismail divorced his wife. He wasn't evil. The messenger, peace and blessings be upon him, he once contemplated divorcing many of his wives. And he divorced Sauda bint Zam'ah. He divorced her. And then he took her back afterwards. So, even prophets went through divorce. If we realize that divorce is something that's not unlawful, it's permissible, then if you separate, you will depart, depart according to what the Quran tells us. And the Quran tells us, depart with Ihsan. Ihsan is being excellent, excellency. We as Muslims, we have to be muhsin, muhsinun. In Allah has kitab al ihsan ala kulli shay. Allah has written ihsan on everything. Everything we do, we do it in an excellent way. If either qataltum fa'ahsin wa qitla, wa either dabahtum fa'ahsin wa dibha. Even when you slaughter an animal, slaughter it with ihsan. Divorce through ihsan, Allah says, at-talaqu marratan, fa imsaakum bi ma'roofin aw tasriihum bi ihsan. If you want to divorce, Divorce with Ihsan. You know what the way of Islamic way of divorce is? The Islamic way of divorce is, and then I will end with this inshaAllah, the Islamic way of divorce is that, like for example, the man says to the wife, that, sorry, we couldn't get, get on with one another, no hard feelings, sorry, I wasn't good enough for you, inshaAllah, may Allah bless you, give you a better man, a better, better husband than me. The wife goes to the husband, sorry, you know, we couldn't work, make things work out, etc. May Allah bless you with a better wife than me. And you have a good life in future. And move on with Ihsan. And in, according to Islam, the man is encouraged to give a small gift, which is called muta'a. Everybody knows about one muta'a. You know? But this muta'a, mati'uhunna ala al-musi'i qadr wa ala al-mukhti'i qadr wa mata'am al-ma'roof haqqan ala al-muhsineen. The ones who are the doers of good. When you leave, depart, when you divorce the wife, what do you do? Give her a small gift. Well, what's the reason? No hard feelings. But what happens in our community? Lifelong enemies. What do you mean no hard feelings? All hard feelings. And then, even worse than that, even worse than that, is when children are used, and that, I don't want to get into that subject, because I feel very strong about that. Children are used to, I mean, forget the spouses here. Here the oppression is on the child. The child needs a father. The child needs a mother. People use their children as shields. Why did a man divorce me? I will make sure he'll never see a father. You're, you're oppressing the kid, the child, the son. He needs a father and a, and a mother. And that's why we have people like fathers for justice. They need justice. Right? So anyway, inshallah, there are many, many things that could be said. There are rules of child custody in Islam, not according to cultural customs, etc., etc., inshallah. And we'll have some questions, but I end with this. Wassalamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.